All right, we are live. Enterprise Month in review. I have my usual co-pilot. Sorry for the <laughs> buzzword there, Brian Summer. What up? <laughs> Would be the haps, John. <laughs> I, I didn't know I'd been relegated to co-pilot. But it is a promotion. I used to be the flight engineer, and before that, I was the gun turret pilot, uh, gun turret operator. So anyway, um, yeah, this one was exciting too. It was like running down the tarmac with that takeout from the uh, from Chick Fil A's or whatever. It's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Right yeah. before go live. All right, this is great. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Um, hey, folks, uh, please chime in in the chat so I know that it's everything is streaming on LinkedIn. If you have any trouble on LinkedIn, we have a YouTube link I can pop you, um, but hopefully LinkedIn is working well. And uh, yeah, we we were off on the road for a little bit, Brian, so we lost our usual monthly rhythm, but this is still the month in review, and we got a special guest high in park uh, who earned his way onto the show with a really meaty blog post on FinOps. So I'm looking forward to that discussion, but that means we only have a handful of minutes to bring everyone up to speed on all the things that we learned on Tarmex this fall. I know that uh, I've seen plenty of Vegas, and I'll be going back there, it looks like, in the end of September for Acumatica. I don't know if January, I think you mean, yep. End yep. of January, January, excuse me, yeah. Yep. Yep. And then i got to be uh, somewhere else first week of February, I think, in Austin, and i got another invitation to be in Atlanta also in uh, late January. So the uh, the travel schedule's filling up again. It's, um, Always well, does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, we saw right. some interesting things this year, John, and I don't want us to necessarily recap all those because today we always follow this kind of an agenda. So Indeed. So we'll start it off as usual with uh, what today's cringy buzzword is going to be, and then we'll jump into each of our underrated enterprise stories. Um, a hint, John actually flagged one of the same stories. And there's our new buzzword of the day. Fod Fo what, the what the hell is productivity? Productivity. Well, I saw that it was talking about how there are people who kind of remind you in Dunes, not Dunesbury, in Dilbert, do you remember there was Wally who walked around all the time with a coffee mug, you know, sitting in on meetings that he wasn't even invited to? He yeah. always looked productive, but he never really did anything. And apparently, productivity is a real problem out there in the workforce with people who are not putting in the effort, but definitely showing up in the office and looking busy. So. That's a new one to hey. add to the new one to add to the the dictionary or thesaurus. Uh, anyway, yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who was in like a very long um, staff meeting, and I suggested that he would have like a B roll footage of himself like moving around and like responding, you know, with facial expressions to things people were saying on video. So that would be a great productivity little. <laughs> <laughs> little zoom b-roll action it well it'd be even better if you could add it to like on the chat stream instead of having those little emojis or those clapping hands floating up if you actually had those little you know video bites uh to go with it i could do a pretty wicked eye roll uh apparently that's something someone from forrester told me at an analyst meeting a few weeks ago but anyway uh hello linkedin user yes comments are welcome here in fact, I was wondering if the LinkedIn stream was working, so you are the first one in, so please uh, chime in because you are part of the show, and Brent is requesting Dr. Pepper. Hmm. Brian, he usually doesn't share his Dr. Pepper, Brent, just so you know. So That is, that's there, and tell Brent that just in case I actually have a pure sugar version of Dr. Pepper waiting right here on the desk, just in case, you know, we run into a problem. <clears throat> All right. John, John's always under uh under opinionated, or that was Dennis Howlett, and I'm always over caffeinated. So anyway, we're we're good to go. Wait, I'm under opinionated. Wow. Um uh, all right. Uh here we go. Top stories. Um my top pick, well, one of the two was there were a bunch of stuff going on around uh Copilot. There was uh actually there was a business insider article as well. Um 
we are building the plane as we fly it. Nothing else matters. They want a co-pilot tie-in for everything. So I think this is interesting because, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, outside of like a core sort of enterprise software focus, there's sort of what you might call big AI. And big AI, big AI is under the investor microscope, and that has a lot of implications. So Microsoft is, it's not... It's not necessarily that Copilot is like a bad product or anything like that. It's the amount of money that if, that Microsoft is sinking in has investors' attention versus returns. And then when you hear stories inside of Microsoft around frustrations around the emphasis on Copilot and that that sense of force fitting AI into everything, and I think what we're going to find is that some AI use cases are really good and some are not, and some quote unquote co-pilots are incredibly useful and some are not. Um, when I'm messing about in a Word document, I am not wishing I had a smarter version of Clippy sitting around. So it really depends on on the use case. And, you know, we shall see. I mean, I do think, for example, that when Microsoft eventually gets a decent co-pilot for Excel, that it will be useful for some individuals to ask questions about the documents they're reviewing and such. So I'm not saying that Copilot's a failure, but I'm saying that there's this underlying narrative around AI that I think is going to get a lot of investor pushback. And Copilot is right in the crosshairs at the moment with a bunch of stories coming out on that. And then we have a little sunk cost fallacy. Hi, Sheree. Yes, indeed. So, so I think what I think what we're seeing here, John, in Gartner speak is we've gone from this peak of expectations. We're starting to trickle down into the trough of disillusionment before we bounce out of that and hit something that's more a more nuanced kind of way that people are going to want to use it. I think you're right that some of the use cases are great and some aren't. And I think, like you said, there are uh, they're trying to change the tire while the car is rolling down the road, and it's going to take a little while to figure out what's uh, what's going to stick and what's not. Yeah, and and I'm, and uh, by the way, folks, if you think like, oh, great, another hour of AI. Actually, specifically, our guest is coming on to talk about something non-AI. So that's how he earned his way onto the show. Though I am going to ask him about AI too. But anyway, um, on this topic. Uh, seven ways Gen AI can create more work than it saves. An interesting in-depth piece on CIO, but one of the reasons I selected it was because I felt like I've been writing about this concept of AI dissonance and how challenging this is for buyers because the exact same week that this came out, Digonomica published a piece on uh, uh, Josh Burson's thinking around uh, basically Burson saying that, you know, almost sort of a celebration of ROI on Gen AI um, in HR. Now, I happen to disagree with uh, what Josh Pershin was putting out there around ROI, and I, I would really question how you would calculate ROI right now when so many of the cost factors aren't established in some of the use cases, especially in HR, are pretty, I would say, immature because of the risk profile of HR in general. But having said that, he has a position, and he talks to a lot of customers, and then Here's a different position, which is really questioning in some cases whether the return is there. So this is why we're here today, really, is that, Brian, what we're trying to do is to try to parse that a little bit and help folks make sense of this so that when they go back to their projects, they they can talk about these things in ways that are coherent. And I think it's really difficult to do that right now because you get such drastically different perspectives, and that even includes on, on Tijanomica at times. So uh, anyway, I don't think this is an easy uh, terrain to navigate, but I thought this was one of the better articles in terms of like a sober, but not necessarily skeptical take, but more drawing on some of the existing lessons from customers and and saying, hey, um, you know, we're struggling with the business case aspect of this. I think the business case has real challenges because we don't know. A lot of vendors haven't been very forthcoming all year long about how they're going to really price out some of the AI capabilities in their products. I mean, we get some vague, vague generalities like, well, much of it will be free and it's part of the core product, but some things may come in and add a charge. But we don't know what that is. But that's just that's just the dollar, the immediate dollar and cents pricing. There's other stuff around. Well, what's the if I got to do carbon accounting and and other kinds of reporting to really get a full look at the ROI? Then I got to ask, 
well, what data centers is this running out of? What's their emissions footprint? What's their water consumption and so forth? Because if I got to buy carbon offsets or, or, or monetize it that way, then that affects the ROI as well. Anyway, we got a lot of work to do on ROI for AI today. Yeah, for sure. And, and look, some of the ROI stuff is actually good news. Like uh, I talked to a few smaller part partners in the last couple of weeks building on you know, inside the quote unquote ecosystem. And some of them are using much smaller models that are pretty affordable for them to build and run. Um, so some of that porting down to smaller models is going to improve some of the ROI calculations. But the point is it's a moving target. I think that's right. that's the real takeaway here. Uh, Brent, you say that Copilot may be the thing that makes privacy more important to users. That would be an accomplishment of sorts. I don't know about Copilot in general, but I know that that uh, if you didn't feel a little creepy reading about Microsoft Recall and how Microsoft was going to put something on your computer that basically uh, recorded all of your keystrokes, yeah, that's all of them. Uh, even the keystrokes that you're using to read about, I don't know, your World Wrestling Federation Fantasy League or something uh, and going into your AI, yeah, that's, that's, that's an awkward moment. Of course, that was tabled for now. But I think that that hunger for data is a, is is kind of the crossroads between like the kind of AI that's going to be helpful and the kind of AI that's going to feel more like surveillance, and so maybe that will lead to a better privacy discussion. If so, I look forward to having it with you on one of your shows. And uh, underrated story, I just want to just breeze through this, Brian, because we want to get to yours. But I thought it was cool that Spotify came out with a uh, with some work from anywhere stats around their successes with lower attrition and increased diversity, which is kind of no duh. But uh, with so many companies kind of doing this forced March return to office and taking flack from users, it was cool to see a company that is sticking to their guns around work from anywhere. And it opens up an interesting discussion on what's working for them. And they admitted they have challenges with certain aspects of it. But I like seeing a, com a major company use this as a competitive advantage. Pinterest, uh, they're uh, I think head of HR did a really good uh, assessment of that. I tweeted about that earlier this week. Came to the same conclusion that uh, uh, they're going to continue with a lot of their uh, work from home kind of stuff, not return to office. But anyway, indeed, uh, I, on to, on I, to a lot you. of those stories. All right, so me, I, this article just blew me away. So we're talking about Southwest Airlines, someone that John and I spend lots of time. Oh with. yeah. Uh, and Southwest, uh, some, somebody decided to answer the question why they don't fly to Canada. And if you read this little sound bite the, or whatever quote I pulled out of the story, it's because they can't process a transaction in Canadian dollars. Now, I about fell out of my chair when I read that, that South, you know, Southwest systems can't handle a different currency. And I'm like, wow. Uh, every financial accounting system since about the late 80s, early 90s has been able to handle multiple currencies, multi-currency accounting, and, 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 and. All kinds of banks can handle transactions across borders. And then you get an entity as big as Southwest that can't handle it. And it was so like, you know, folks, every time when you think we've solved certain problems and like wiped them out, we'll never see it again. It's like, it's like some disease, like the plague that pops back up every, you know, decade or so somewhere in some corner of the world. And this one, a major, major company can't handle foreign currency. That just blew me away. And by the way, I thought, if, I thought AI could fix that, but I'm so confused. Well, but I'm um, waiting for the, uh, but if Southwest needs to talk to somebody who knows how to put one of those kind of systems in, give me a call. Uh, you saw my, um, uh, my LinkedIn handle at Brian S. Summer. I'll be happy to talk to you about what you need for that. Second story. This was a real sad tearjerker kind of story. A first person piece. This woman wrote about how she quit teaching at the college level. She taught a course on for grad students to figure out how to do a great job of writing their thesis and, you know, for their PhD papers. And she just finally gave up. Because she was reading and correcting these things. Her whole course is to teach them how to freaking write. And what did they do? They instead would feed their thing into chat GPT. And, the, you know, this uh, professor, she was just talking about how it was so frustrating. She was basically correcting chat GPT generated 
papers, theses, and I'm like, wow, uh, this is a real challenge here. Uh, and anyway, I, you know, this was this shows how if you give people crutches, you know, that they can fall back on, if they use them enough, they don't ever actually learn a good skill. Same thing. And I, hmm? I was just going to say, we're going to stop the show now and watch Idiocracy for the rest of the hour. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I read, Brian, I read about one professor, I think there's some interesting creative things, like I read one professor who was, who challenged their students to actually submit essays using chat GPT, but then to find the mistakes in it. I think, but I can totally see how a teacher would just throw their hands up at this point, but anyway, we shall see. All we're right. Basically, we're basically screwed, right? Um, yeah. Shall we see your next slide here? Okay, yeah. Yeah, you and I both spotted this story. Um why it matters that Google AI's Gemini chatbot made death threats to a grad student. Here's the relevant com content uh, on the, you know, in the middle of the screen here. Uh, that's a tough story. I mean, it makes you, anytime people, I think, get lulled into thinking, well, they've got to have fixed AI now to quit hallucinating and cursing and having Tourette syndrome problems, everything else. And then you get another story like this pops up in the news to remind you, nope. That this problem has not gone away. It's not finished. It's not solved. And back to an earlier comment you made at the beginning of the deal where you talk about the value of a smaller LLM set. I think that's absolutely critical to getting some of this stuff out. If you use more generalized, big, uh, large language models, there's just too many mathematical opportunities for horrible things like this to keep popping up. Limit the size of the LLM, and it's probably going to stay a lot more focused. But that yeah. doesn't mean it won't run out, r overrun its boundaries, nonetheless. It might at times. I've I've seen a couple of encouraging examples on the road of of demos of a smaller models that that they were able to pretty much force to pull from the so called context window. In other words, from the enterprise data and not freelance like this. But uh, I'm still investigating the degree to which you can do that 100 percent of the time. But but I would say that if an enterprise uh, LLM uh, had this kind of a problem, that would actually be bad design um, and bad uh, usage of an LLM, like if you, if you had this mm -hmm. kind of extreme. But it is interesting because it shows you that these big models in particular that are trying to be incredibly versatile for consumers are deeply flawed. And, and, and the LLM can choose at any point to refuse the context window and, and, and basically sorts its own answer. And check out the answer. The answer was pretty problematic. So, uh, so Brian, you're absolutely right. This is a major flag for anyone who's like thinking, oh, this is like some foolproof technology. So, oh, we got Sam's comment on airlines. Uh, the problem with airlines might not be ERP systems. The problem could be reservation systems such as Sabre, which are just irreplaceable. Well, I'm not, Sam, I'm not saying it is an ERP problem. I'm saying that the ERP vendors nailed this you know, 30 years ago, the fact that um, if if it's still in the old reservation systems or some of those uh, carriers yep. I've actually been to, if it's still in the old 80 column punch card kind of formatted record problems uh, and the systems that work with that. Yeah, that's an issue. But, I, you know, whether you're a passenger or a shareholder, you know, I'm sorry, the, you know, the, this is something, this is a technical debt challenge that a, Airlines should have dealt with a long time ago. Indeed. And with that, Brian, you know how you become a guest on our show? Well, one really good way is to write a really meaty, interesting blog that is not about AI, and that's what our guest has done. Hi, and Park, welcome to the show. Thanks for writing something that was not about AI that we could talk about. You are on mute. Um, but thank you for doing that. Let me see if I can unmute you there. Oh, yeah, there. Let's see. No, that's me. Thanks, again. thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I can talk a lot about AI as well. My company is literally named AI, but uh, yes. but yeah, I, I spent uh, some time thinking about uh, some of the IT cost problems that are out there as well. I'm going to warn you in advance: we are having massive rain here in the Bay Area right now. The oh yeah, you got weather. Uh, so I might be coming in and out uh, of the feed <laughs> at times. Well, well thanks no for joining us. Have no worries. If you do fade out, we'll just make up stuff and say you said it. So don't worry yeah. about it. 
we'll just we'll just use your uh, uh, Amalgam GPT and just keep keep right on going. Yeah, um, I'll just hold up your article and we'll right. uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. So so yeah, we do we ha- oh we actually do yeah. have a graphic we have a graphic of your article. So let's let's show that off. Uh, since yep yep, and we we've even got the slides, so we can review that slide in a little bit. Uh, but but this all stems from some deeper re- research that you've done on IT FinOps. And so what I'd love for you to do is kind of start by s- sort of defining a little bit what that means and also why we should care. And then we'll get into your, your arguments a bit. So why should we care about this topic? Yes. Why does it matter? So a- as prosaic as it is, uh, one of the tenets of uh, the research I do is what I call the IT rule of 30 saying that every unmanaged I and we got and I think area the one, oh, there you go. typically has about 30% in waste and this gets shown over so so based on that uh, we're going to look at uh, when you look at cloud when you look at telecom when you look at network uh, when you look at computing uh, a lot of this 30% waste storage and uh, cloud is no exception and uh, one of the things uh, that has come up uh, over the last couple of years is this concept of fin ops, which doesn't mean financial operations, but specifically financial operations for cloud cost management, because the the cloud people love taking words and turning them into other words. <laughs> uh, but so this really matters right now from an AI perspective, because uh, AI, of course, uses a lot of compute and storage and um, resources in, 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 from a management perspective, and those costs got out, out of control, as well as the rest of cloud computing. Uh, those costs get out of control as well. It's easy to set up new instances, set up new servers, and then simply forget about them after you're done with the testing process. It's easy for testing to get out of control without really keeping track of where your costs are throughout the day, the week, the month, and then just uh, completely go o- over budget in what you're trying to do. And so there are a lot of different tools right now to try to manage those cloud costs, but they're not all working the same way. Some are very focused on optimization at a usage level. Some are focused on helping you choose the right product within a specific hyperscaler, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Some of them help you do that apples to apples comparison. Some of them just help you optimize within your database or in your Databricks or Snowflake instance. You know, so all these different tools are, de- are doing all these different things for cloud costs. And they're right now just kind of lumped into what we're calling FinOps. And each one of these has its strengths and weaknesses. But one of the biggest challenges is that you've got IT organizations that are only using one of these niche solutions and thinking that they've solved the problem. Well, are we are we solving an economic problem or are we solving a technical problem? Because uh, it seems like some companies have created an environment that maybe has got too many choices, too many opportunities. And uh, but I would agree with you that the biggest problem is that no one knows how to plan, forecast, or anticipate what their costs are going to be. I feel sorry for like a CIO, for example trying to know what they're going to get nailed with and some of the newer um uh some of the newer kinds of tools or excuse me uh software products have all these unknown costs and John and I were just talking about this on AI we have no idea what these things are going to cost and we have no idea what the other like uh sustainability costs that are going to come along with this stuff what they're going to be so yeah. without without transparency you you're kind of screwed from a business perspective. You, we had a yeah, momentary so we had a momentary deal where you for- blacked, blanked out there, uh, Hone. Yeah, we sorry. You've had a couple of short freezes, but you're you're mostly holding up. So I think we're going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So there's kind of these three different categories that I think of. Uh, one is around. Optimization, we IT people love to optimize. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of focus on usage optimization and being able to uh, look at 
peak instances versus non-peak and do all of the arbitrage that you can do to find the lowest possible cost for a bit or a byte at a specific time or place. And, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle. But And that's where a lot of FinOps is focused on right now because it's fun. You get to use math. You get to calculate all of your, you know, most optimized uh, instances in ways that speak to the IT person. But these other two areas speak to what Brian was talking about, visibility, which are less well-known. And and so a, a second area where FinOps can fit in, but fewer solutions do, is around trend management and being able to actually figure out uh, which variances matter more uh, from 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 a calendar perspective, from a business perspective, from a product perspective, being able to actually categorize this stuff from a business definition. And then there's a third piece that we take for granted in more of the finance and ERP world around planning, budgeting, forecasting, and actually thinking about what you'd want to, this to look like for next year, which is done very poorly at this point. So one of the things that happens a lot in FinOps right now is called tagging, where you will literally tag each resource with your definitions or your keywords uh, that are associated with that resource. But there's not really a good way to align that to standard business terminology. So stuff like the GL and all of the categories that we have had in ERP forever, your cost center, your profit center, your GL, you know, all things, all these things, like they are not put in by default into FinOps. So you've got this intermediate mishmash of metadata right now that is defining all your IT resources. And right now, everybody's trying to figure out how to turn that mishmash into the business definitions that we've had for 30, 40, 50 years. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about there's a problem with the chart of accounts in the financial accounting system. There's almost like a uh, data warehouse that's powering the analytics behind some of the FinOp stuff. The two don't necessarily share the same data model or data dictionary. And therefore, whenever you try to do the reporting, you've got all the usual problems with data accuracy, data latency, um, um, uh, granularity differences, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I suspect a lot of CIOs really struggle with, they get highly annualized, highly aggregated highly average kind of data from vendors. They just get this bill that shows up maybe once a quarter, once a year or whatever. And they're trying to figure out, well, what do I do with this? You know, who, what department do I charge it back to, uh, you know, or which, how much of it can I charge back? I, I, again, well, let me, let me push it forward. If we look at one of my clients figured something out last year, this time last year at the uh, Ceridian conference, were you there last week? Uh, as well, or I no? wasn't there. <laughs> okay. Well, they figured something out then, which was we need to quit buying all these best of breed cloud HR uh, technologies because not only is the administration and management of all of that different kind of software just a headache and a half, to your point, but they also realized that to get any value out of artificial intelligence tools on an economical basis, they need to get everything down as much as possible to one master set of data with one co consistent set of meanings and so forth. So where are you seeing, are you seeing any discussion in the FinOps world where people are talking about, let's scrub out some of this best of breed stuff. And are we looking at a new, a new age of people looking at more larger suites? I think that from a FinOps perspective, the, the bigger challenge tends to be around creating duplicate instances of very large environments because you're trying to test for various different things and create all sorts of different models. Mm -hmm. But there is also this problem of integration that we've been throwing crap into data lakes for the past decade plus. And that can also lead to massive data growth over time because it's not obviously a very bad process. Uh, we have kind of, we kind of gave up on the idea of a golden record of truth for a while because we were so focused on trying to turn exhaust, data exhaust into some sort of uh, guiding light. <laughs> and it turns out that a lot of crap is actually just crap. Uh, so, <laughs> but having that crap um, and not having great retention or governance uh, leads to simply having those 
ongoing costs or year over year uh, if you don't clean up that data. So that's an issue uh, from, from the cost side as well. I, I realize there are other business issues associated with data, but I'm just thinking about the cost side right now. So yeah, and I want to ask you about that in the context of AI, because do you think that so-called AI tooling uh, can alleviate some of what you're describing around the sort of data lake, uh, throw it and hope for the best imperative? Because my first sort of gut reaction is that that it, that it can't, but maybe I'm wrong. I think there's room to do some optimization, definitely, and rules-based or kind of policy-based uh, cleanups of the data that could make the data more optimization. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we've really figured out how to do that well yet, though, because we're still trying to figure out how much we can trust AI, well, especially generative AI and more policy-based or uh, kind of these uh, fluffy qualitative judgment-based uh, policies that we've been creating and using as prompts. Right. Uh, it would be great to be able to have a better idea of how those directly translate into data cleansing and data quality and workflow management and optimization type practices. But I think another challenge there is that these models are changing so quickly that you don't really know what a prompt is going to do for you from month to month or even week to week. These models get changed quickly, right. the logic gets changed, <laughs> and we're still experimenting with how to create our own custom prompts uh, which lead to that issue as well. How how do we get back to AI? We were talking, doing so well talking about. <laughs> I know we made it for like we made it for a period of time there, uh, and 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 it was my fault too. Um, hey, uh, there's there's a paragraph in your piece that I thought was really powerful, um, and I think it applies both to your piece but in general to our industry because one of the things I don't know about you guys, but that I struck been struggling with all year is hearing vendors deliver what they think is differentiating messaging around a topic that turns out to not really be differentiating at all. And how do, and how do we move past that without people feeling, vendors getting their feelings hurt so badly that we can't even have a conversation? Um, and you wrote a paragraph about that that I'm going to read now. Uh, you, this is about IT FinOps, but you could apply this, I think, this type of attitude to a lot of things. Let's just define what is not considered differentiated in 2024. Simply ingesting bills is not good enough. Being quote unquote customer centric and having attention to detail are considered table stakes. If you cannot provide customers that vouch for your approach being quantitative, quantitatively better than other competitors, everybody I cover can support tagging. And then you go on to talk about these other things. And if you haven't chosen a high performance analytics solution, you're probably behind for supporting real-time changes. I thought that was really powerful, and I think probably one of your, your big challenges around all of this is, is getting that across and then helping buyers to understand what's fluff and what's not. I, to me, this feels like the core struggle right now. Yeah, and we all hear this, uh, you know, all, uh, at least all three of us here right now hear this all the time about how we provide visibility. Our customers love us nobody's ever done it the way we've done it before. You know, these, for us, this is just something we hear 10 times a week from every vendor under the sun. And I, I think this is a disservice to the technology world in general because vendors aren't pushing themselves to really say what they're doing that's different. And honestly, once I dig into a vendor's offerings, usually I can find something that's different. but when the vendor themselves can't tell you what they're doing that's different, uh, that's a problem. So let me jump back in, guys. Uh, first of all, am I frozen? Because you guys are on my screen, and I may have to log off and log back you in. You are good, Brian. You are moving with okay. fluidity. So, well, All right. So uh, I wanted to just amplify a point you were talking a minute ago, uh, Hon, about uh, missing integrations or integrations and reports and data warehouses and like. One of the things I'm noticing is when I help companies on a strategic planning effort, that uh, the first thing I do is nowadays is I take an inventory of all the missing or screwed up integrations because those have huge added costs that come with it. Uh, I'm also looking at all the reports and what's missing and how many things uh, I still run into spots 
software packages on the shelf. These are applications that somebody bought, never put in. All of these kind of things impact the economics of what's going on from not just at the data center level, but all the way through to the end users. And I was just curious if you have a modern kind of perspective on this. Um, uh, are you, you know, what's the conversation like in your circles on those kind of points? It's interesting that I think that there's multiple sets of integrations right now. You know, there's kind of the standard application integration world where you've got, oh, you know, the Informaticas of the world or the Orcadas of the world, uh, mm -hmm. SnapLogic, whatever, you know, who are helping with those uh, direct integrations. But, and, you know, I would say, you know, probably the top couple hundred enterprise applications tend to be covered okay at this point, if you are either doing that or working with an SAP or Oracle that will help you with uh, those top level of integrations. Uh, the problem is that the average uh, company and average large enterprise at this point is using over a thousand dApps. And those other 800 are either left off as silos or they're brought in via some sort of REST APIs. And there isn't great a great set of ways to deal with the orchestration of APIs or uh, the oncoming agents, the agentic AI stuff uh, that is starting to come in as well. Um, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly what is coming from what and to handle data lineage across that uh, from end to end. Uh, so there, there's, there are these different levels of challenge that are happening right now. And I feel like the API and agent side uh, really need a lot of work. Uh, while there's this core IT, which is becoming, you know, less and less uh, important to the entire organization as a whole, still important, but with, you know, with a lowering amount of, of importance than it used to have. Uh, that is, um, you know, so that's kind of a problem. You, you've got to deal with core versus this expanded long tail that is getting more complex with the rise of AI. So what about the intersection set between what you're writing about and the old um, software asset m maintenance or software application uh, management where people were trying to keep track of usage and are we getting in trouble from an audit perspective or uh, do we have a vulnerability to, to use an old school term here, to uh, indirect access or other kinds of um, per transaction kind of charges? Yeah, that yeah, that license uh, management world, uh, you know, the software asset management, SAM, is definitely a piece of the puzzle of what I consider to be part of the bigger picture of IT FinOps. And with on-prem, the biggest problem tended to be that your vendor would audit you and then, you know, stick you with an extra, you know, X million dollars <laughs> uh, based on what you ended up using versus what you thought you were using and uh, your ability to reallocate or not reallocate licenses, things like that. Uh, interestingly with, you know, that's the on-prem side. SaaS has the opposite problem in that, uh, you have all these extra licenses and normally you end up trying to, uh, it, it's, it's like the reverse problem, uh, in that you are trying to actually cut costs. Uh, you're trying to find your duplicates and you can remove them at any time because it's SaaS, but you have to know that those licenses were, were even created. And it can mm -hmm. be a big problem because, uh, for instance, when you look at your Microsoft 365 bill, often it'll say just, just something like 1,500 licenses. It's like, great. Who has those? I don't know, because my bill literally just says 1,500 and just stops there. And then they'll give you like a million lines of usage data uh, that are, tell you all sorts of other things that you don't care about, but you can't even tell who has what without personally doing a lot of this tracking yourself. So that happens on the SaaS side. And then there's kind of related problems with cloud computing as well, where you've got a, where you just know you have all this, all these resources. You don't know what they're aligned to. You don't know what you're using them for because you just have this one line item that says 187,000 of this. <laughs> and then you've got to figure out the mess. So. Uh, I'm a buy side advocate for clients and I'll represent them a lot of times in software negotiations. And some of the things I do, I know just irritate vendors to no end, but 
but I don't like things like embedded URLs and contracts. I tell them we won't accept them. I don't want, I want very clear. I give them a schedule. I want them to map out the cost over the next eight to 10 years based on some assumptions that I give them. Uh, I try and even get them to accept the client's paper, not their own. Mm-hmm. I rarely can win that argument, but anyway, bear with me. My point being, I, I'm not sure that vendors have constructed, for the most part, a contracting environment that is transparent, understandable, or uh, even makes common sense or even good business sense from time to time. Uh, you know, you you know, you can't do some of the things you're talking about because people just can't understand why. Do I, a 20 person company, need an 1100 page contract from like Microsoft? I don't get it. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I see why people like solutions like Zoho, you know, where it's, it's so many dollars per month per user, period. You know, I mean, you, you can't say you didn't understand what that, you know, what the terms of that were going to be. And, I'm wondering, have the vendors just basically created all this extra work for legions of people like you, for software companies to create solutions to make sense of a vendor-induced insanity that's out there in the marketplace? It should not be this difficult to give vendors money, I I guess, that's where I'm going. Come on, man. Heinz trying to make some money here too, Brian. Right? That's job security right there. Come on. (laughs) Exactly. That's well, he, can, uh, he, can that join, can... he can join me on the dark side of the force and fight the good fight here. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is interesting how that value proposition has changed. I, I know that when I was getting my MBA back in the 2000s and we talked about B2B pricing, it was about extract, extracting value in that uh, Jack Welch kind of way. Uh, basically, jack up the price to the point where the or the client is uh, not happy, not sad, just kind of, you know, flat somewhere in the middle <laughs> and, uh, and dealing with that. But honestly, the, the world has changed. And I think the ex- value exchange has to be seen as a little bit more equitable and easier at the end of the day. And I've actually seen that in the FinOps solutions that I've covered, where uh, 10 years ago, they were all about charging as a percentage of spend. So if you were managing a million dollars of spend, you might spend you know, 2%, 20% on that solution. But it's increasingly gone to either a license-based or flat fee-based uh, pricing because it's just too hard to keep with up, with that, up with that. And because cloud has grown so quickly, if you have a $100 million bill, you're not going to pay $2 million just for this software solution that did the same thing that you were, it was doing when you were paying $20,000 for it. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I would agree that the value proposition in our industry overall is better and that cloud has something to do with it. But I would also kind of agree with the general tenor of this discussion that the pitfalls are still there and that the the room for improvement is still drastic. In fact, uh, it was only a few weeks ago I was at an event where there was, a, I'll call out McKinsey on this one, there was a McKinsey analyst supposedly dispensing guru level wisdom to the crowd at lunch who said, one of the big trends for the year is getting B2B customers to eat more costs. And I just sat there kind of dumbfounded, but, <laughs> but, I, but I did respect the sort of blatant sort of strip mining attitude that was being put out there. But my immediate thought was like, why not figure out how to give them more value and how to reduce your costs? Like maybe that's your job. And, and if AI is so great, by the way, maybe AI should be helping you to do that so that you don't have to get your customers to quote unquote eat costs. Wow. So, well, so, the- so, so my point being that that attitude isn't gone away. So let me piggyback on that, John, your, um, I run with a rough crowd of, uh, of, um, litigators in the software world. And I'm, they're always sending me, uh, copies of filings and so forth and see what I think about some of this stuff. And I got one this week, and it was some of the most egregious wallet grabbing I've ever seen by a software company. And it, this is one of those companies that just owns some really antiquated assets and is just jacking up fees and finding any excuse they can trying to wallet frack a customer. So 
Uh, yeah, that attitude is definitely out there and prevalent. And frankly, um, I think if I were, if I had the economic power and muscle of a company like uh, Walmart, let's say behind me, I'd basically point, you know, point out to vendors, this is the way we're going to do business. This is how it's going to be done. And don't come at me with any of these like um, URL based contracts that no one can understand. If it takes a PhD and English lit and advanced heuristics to understand your contract, you don't know what your business is all about. And you definitely don't want my business if you're that tone deaf in the way you want to interact with customers. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I just feel like the industry made a problem and we're trying to find a technology to solve a self-induced problem. Uh, yes, Brent. He said uh, frack, which is uh, absolutely rated uh, PG and totally acceptable in our chat. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, just catching up on a couple comments, Greg, I'm glad the stream has been better because uh, LinkedIn has had some choppy streams uh, in the last couple of months. We've been complaining about it. Uh, guys, just want to feel this Sam Gupta comment or the other side could be companies like HubSpot, which could feel like checking out a 100K contract on Amazon does not sit very well with CFOs. Any comment on that? Well, I've still got the frozen screen, so I have no idea what the comments are. I'm totally flying blind. So, uh, Well, I just read it to you, Brian. Well, yeah, I, I understand. I have no comment on the HubSpot deal. Uh, okay. I'm not close to that one at all. So sorry about that. Uh, as Shiri says, clearly we need a vendor to provide an AI to interpret complicated contracts. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's made it in jets. something that generative AI actually gets used to do to try to figure sure. out the net net of contracts. So my, my brother, Leonard, who I hype up every time I can, uh, he actually works in legal tech. He's a product manager uh, working on using generative AI to figure out how to uh, you know, go through these thousand page contracts and lawsuits and patent filings and you know tra uh, trademarks etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, to figure out what's what's the meat and what isn't and you know he happens to be a lawyer and now he's going to end up taking a bunch of legal work away from lawyers <laughs> yeah which brings me back to ai for a moment if 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 you all can in, indulge the ai topic because uh in June of 2023, uh, Hein, you wrote, I thought, one of the sort of seminal posts, uh, Instant Mediocrity, a Business Guide to Chat GPT. And I thought that instant mediocrity phrase was, was really important and powerful and perhaps misunderstood in the sense that you weren't trying to necessarily use, say that was an insulting term. Um, because one of the points you were making is that instant mediocrity at scale can actually be pretty valuable because uh, that's way more than a individual human can do, right? And you know, when I when I initially read your article, I, that rang true for me for a lot of Gen AI use cases that still do. In the sense that when I think about things like code generation or content generation, I do think of it a little bit like me mediocrity on a certain level. That you know, okay, the code may look great, but there's also security and quality control and everything else going back into that code and fixing it later. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some Gen AI capabilities that feel a little beyond the word mediocre. For example, the contract scrutiny you provide. I think one of the things Gen AI is especially good at is the kind of summarization of lengthy documents that it would, I think, probably get a grade a little above mediocre in my book in many cases. How has that post aged for you? And if you were writing it today, would you do the same post or would you make some changes? Um, I think the biggest change that I've seen from a generative AI perspective is that we are getting better at creating targeted agents and uh, specific prompts to get work done more consistently. Uh, we're, we're starting to understand how to shape that language and to provide enough context to get yep. to a, a useful outcome. Uh, we are better at understanding, still still not there, but better at understanding that AI is, uh, generative AI is not factual in nature, but is there to provide th the vibes, uh, the, you know, the feeling of what, uh, how a question should be answered based on the audience or the data that you are basing that answer on. 
Uh, so we have a better idea of understanding that, uh, say, the generative AI doesn't care that Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. What it cares about is what is considered the capital of the United States by the data that it's looking at. And if that happens to be Washington, D.C., great, we're in alignment. If not, generative AI is just going to say, you know, Dallas is the capital of, you know, the United States. It, it doesn't care. It's just, just looking for whatever the data thinks uh, that it's looking at thinks is correct. Uh, so there's that. And then I think there's a third point around generative AI still being challenged to handle multi-stage processes because it forgets what it's doing uh, while it's going. I, I, so I can, uh, uh, you know, I am very sympathetic to that. I do that myself when I'm working. So, you know, generative AI, AI and I have something in common there. Um, but, you know, it, it loses its track of thought halfway through, which leads to things like the uh, traumatic Gemini uh response that you shared earlier in the show <laughs> where you know it just lost its head uh and just ended up giving this rando answer and that's definitely a threat for a generative ai when you're doing something that is uh step by step by step by step sometimes it just loses the track entirely yeah so w would you say you stand by the instant mediocrity phrase as a description then I think instant mediocrity, if you're doing a sp trying to conduct one specific task, but we're seeing mm -hmm. that with a chain of tasks, there can be issues. And we're seeing some areas where uh, it is either better than or worse than average. It is worse than average mm -hmm. at factual recall. It is better than average at summarizing existing bodies of content. So, so, so as, I, as I've kind of been bearing down on this, you know, I'm looking... I'm going to publish again shortly on on some cool examples of getting like with smaller models that are fit for purpose that that do that perform a lot better than the so-called Gemini example. So there's some interesting stuff, uh, and there's also some interesting non-Gen Gen AI folks doing stuff in labs that I think are that are worth worthy of amplification. I just wrote about active inference AI and some of the interesting stuff going on there. But um, but when I think about the enterprise, I think about sometimes I get cynical because I feel like the reason Gen AI is being embraced so heavily is because of existing shortcomings in lack of automation that should have already been done already, and, and also poor user interfaces getting bailed out by, by a more interactive vibe, as you said, uh, but, but perhaps at an expense of that, of that uh, user interface not really uh, being as reliable as you might want. Um, but one thing I do think is super interesting, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of in the next year, is sort of a combination of unstructured and structured data into new business processes. Because the one strength that I've really seen in Gen AI is that ability to work with unstructured data. And then you look at developments around knowledge graphs and, and better uh, use of structured data alongside that from more tabular formats inside of transactional systems. I think those building blocks are interesting. I, I haven't seen a really good example of that yet. But I think that's super interesting because there's so much potent unstructured data in the enterprise that really doesn't get taken into account when decisions are made and, and when, you know, and when we're interacting with our stakeholder groups. And I think that's interesting, but I haven't really seen a lot yet. I don't know. I'm, I feel I don't know like every year gets hyped up to be the year of the knowledge graph and we never quite. We never get there, do we? <laughs> yeah. To yeah, quote, we don't. To quote John, I think how you just said the trenchant comment of the uh, podcast. That's John's Indeed. word, by the way. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Very trenchant. Yeah. And interaction is definitely not engagement. That is not always the same thing. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's interesting. I'll, I'll look forward at some point to, uh, to part two of that post because I think you, I think you framed like that era of Gen AI very well. And I suspect we're moving into kind of a new era that could use a little reframing of that. Yeah. One of the so. things I'm really interested in seeing is Mark Benioff said, basically at Dreamforce, he wants to see a billion agents by next year, which uh, the agents are not hard to build in Salesforce. And of course, other platforms are going to have their own agents as well. So I, I'm, I wouldn't doubt that we have call it, you know, at least many millions of agents out there next next year. And, you know, as that happens, you know, what happens to enterprises once you have thousands of agents that have been user builds? Like, you know, what happens to that layer? Because I think of 
this from an IT perspective, having to orchestrate all of that and figure out, deduplicate perhaps in some instances, figure out which ones are most optimal to do an actual task. And I don't feel like that that middleware-ish and management layer is fully baked in the agent level. I mean, all this is new anyways, but you know that's going to be like a next big headache, I think, for IT people. I, I don't disagree, yeah. but I would think you, one of the bigger problems with getting to the whatever billion of those things is a lack of imagination. I, I'm not sure that enough people are really putting some serious brain power into thinking yeah. through the better ways of doing some work and they're not incorporating that. We, we need to go back to the drawing board and re- radically rethink how we want to get work done. John, I know we got to be careful about the time. Yeah, so. yeah. I think we're. I think we need to wrap the show in a few minutes. Uh, Hi, and we could probably talk with you for another hour. But thanks for dropping the knowledge with us today. That was excellent. Much appreciated. Always my pleasure. And and you you're doing a pretty regular uh, show as well, right? So folks can catch you on a fairly well, regular sure. basis. Um, yeah, I do a weekly show with my friend uh, Charlie Araujo called This Week in Enterprise Tech. Uh, it's cool. up on YouTube. Uh, just look up this week in enterprise tech and it should be there <laughs> awesome thanks for joining us today uh thank you catch you Appreciate later it. good seeing you all right slide or two left but before we go to that one i just got to say i can't believe you retired the uh woody guthrie baseball cap i, I oh it, it's coming back man the woody woody guthrie will be back okay. it's a it's a story not fit for um discussion on this on this episode but i'll tell you later okay um oh uh sheree says uh finops for salesforce agents yeah in indeed um yeah we're gonna need a we're gonna need a real cost benefit analysis of that uh oh we got our humorous whiff for the month don't we um pregnancy tracking app uh refuses to fix issue that allows full account takeover uh you know that's what you want when you want to have an app that respects some of your most private and personal information. You want it taken over. I mean, don't you? Um, anyway. My cynical comment, hey, at least baby will know what to expect from cybersecurity from a young age. I put this one in here. A meta fires a guy pulling down 400000 a year because he used the meal voucher they get uh, for working overtime to buy a uh, to buy toothpaste. Careful with those expense vouchers, folks. Oh, you might yeah. you might get yourself right sized. Mm, that um, you know, they were trying to make some kind of important point there or whatever, but uh, they weren't really. Eh. I'm not sure I agree with quite the tenor of what Meta did there, but they were trying to prove a point that we gave you the meal deal for food, not for toothpaste. Although. I guess if you really wanted to keep your job, you could argue to the Department of Labor that uh, toothpaste is edible at some level. But anyway, Ink says it was a smart move, so I'll have to read the article and and see see what was smart about that. But I guess that's for another time. Um, something that inspires and creates value. Whoa, Brian! Well, I think talk that's- about pulling the rug out from under me, man. I think that's going to be the, uh, I think this can be the unpredictions uh, that are going to be coming out here any day now. Yeah. And um, I've already sent John a, uh, a handsome four page listing of all kinds of interesting content for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It says right. toothpaste is a food like ketchup is a vegetable. And in, in absolutely mm. fair enough. Uh, not anyway, to mention, not to somewhere. mention, I think I think Meta forced everyone back to the office too. So it's like if someone's spending money on toothpaste, it means they're working like twelve-hour shifts and stuff. So, uh, Part, as a co- if I were that yeah. person's coworker, I want somebody with fresh minty breath, not something that smells like cigarettes and coffee and everything else. Is probably so. Getting- so Brent says edible toothpaste. It's come to this. I don't know if it's like. We should. I think I'm going to choose to take pride that our show can devolve into into that by the end. By the way, uh, folks, Brent usually has a show kicking off around this time. So if you want a little more banter, check out Brent and his uh, buddy shortly. Pre- I'm pretty sure you're going on, Brent. If you're not, if if your show's canceled, let us know. But I'm pretty sure you're about to go on. So, uh, Brian, yeah. So un- uh, the unpredictions, um, yeah. Everyone probably knows we issue those every year. Uh, they are still in the oven. 
Uh, so if you if you have any uh, buzzwords you'd like to contribute to our buzzword uh, uh, generation for next year, let us know. If you, can I, I think it. I hope it inspires. I'm not sure if it's going to create value. I think that's that's a. We'll see. Well, and you know, va- you know, having having a humorous moment does create value for a human being. Uh, okay, know, it's, all right. It's one of the emotions. Uh, you know, let's go with it. All right. Well, anyway, uh, it was a great show. Um, yep, Brent's yep. coming up. Yep, Good. yep. Let's seg- segue right on over into Brent's show. Uh, just go to his profile if you're on LinkedIn and uh, fire that up because those guys are always uh, a hoot on Fridays. And, and well, Brent, Brent, I, like I might go, I might go and, and discuss toothpaste with you. <laughs> I was going to say, I love to go on their show and just send in all kinds of little uh, snark bombs on the comment stream. Um, my whole goal in his show is to see if I can make Brent break character and start laughing and <laughs> the audience has no idea why. But anyway. <laughs> All right. John, it was well, a good, uh, I don't know good if we're we going to do another show this year. I'm not sure. Um, we'll have to decide that later. So either we'll do another show towards the end of this year or we'll do a kickoff in January. We'll let you know. Uh, but thanks. Thanks. Thanks all for your uh, salty comments in the chat as well. And I uh, yeah. hope you enjoyed. Nice collection of comments. Thanks, everybody, for being on there. And uh, if uh, I'm sure we're not going to have a chance to say it any other time, but thanks. Have a happy Thanksgiving if you're celebrating that in your household. Thanks for joining all. Catch you later.